I'm revisiting the topic of using the analog discovery, in this particular case the analog discovery 2, to test audio amplifiers. Predominantly amplifiers intended for high fidelity, but it could be others as well. It could be amplifiers that in which distortion is intended, like in many guitar amps and things of that sort. What's on the screen is the input in yellow and the output in blue of a little circuit that I'll show you in a minute. I'm using this circuit to illustrate a point and I suspect that this is going to be several uh, little videos. I like to keep them about uh, 15 or 20 minutes long. So the first subject that I'm going to talk about is transistor output stages in audio amplifiers. And what you're seeing here is a uh, mock-up or an experiment using a Class AB amplifier that is designed using complementary symmetry circuitry. Now I'll talk about all of that later if you haven't heard of this or if you're not as familiar with it as you'd like to be. But what I'm really trying to figure out is whether my, I'm imagining things or whether in fact this trace is slightly distorted, the blue trace, from about here to about here. To me it looks like that instead of going straight across that it curves up slightly here, down slightly there, and then rejoins the normal sine curve. The reason that I'm interested in that particular area of the curve is that is the transition region in a Class AB amplifier. Later we'll look at the spectrum and see if it shows anything about this, but generally in a Class AB amplifier, unless you have some form of clipping or limiting or some other nonlinearity in the circuit, the predominant distortion is in this crossover point. The reason is that a Class AB amplifier uses one transistor for this cycle and a different transistor for this cycle. And as this transistor hands off the uh, control to the other transistor, they often don't quite match up here. In fact, that's one of the challenges of designing a good AB amplifier to work with high fidelity signals. So let's take a look at the circuit that we're examining here. Here is the circuit that we'll look at in a second on the breadboard. But this is a fairly typical complementary symmetry output stage for a solid state amplifier. It's called complementary because you may notice that this transistor is an NPN transistor, this one is a PNP. The emitters are connected together, so each of them operates as an emitter follower into this 100 ohm load. Now in, say, a hi-fi amp, this would normally be uh, the speaker, uh, an 8 ohm load or a 4 ohm load or a 16 ohm load or something like that. I'm just using 100 ohms here to keep the power dissipation down because these are not really power transistors and this is only intended to demonstrate the principle. So NPN, PNP. On the left is a operational amplifier. It's actually a 741 that I'm using. It's really unimportant to this. It's really just intended to provide higher input impedance and to give a gain of about two. Now if you're familiar with operational amplifiers you know that normally you measure the gain by taking the ratio of this resistor to this resistor, which in this case is 1. But since we're applying the input to the positive instead of to the negative uh, or inverting input, the gain of this stage is actually 1 plus the ratio of these resistors, so it's actually a gain of 2. We then take the output through this 470 ohm isolation resistor to this point. Now normally that would simply connect to each of these two bases. We'll talk about these diodes in a second. If we simply connected this, in other words if the diodes were shorted, this would be a class B amplifier. 
class B in that for no input signal, neither transistor would conduct at all. Furthermore, when the signal went positive, this transistor would conduct. When the in signal goes negative, this transistor would conduct through the base to the emitter and through the load resistor. The diodes are put in there because if you simply used the input to these bases without the diodes, the base would have to rise about six or seven tenths of a volt above zero in order to turn on this transistor. So as the signal went cross to zero, say going from negative to positive, it would have to go about 0.6 or 0.7 volts positive before it would turn on this transistor. When it came negative, it would have to go 0.6 or 0.7 volts negative to turn on this transistor. So that's about a 1.5 volt gap and that will cause severe distortion in the output. So what designers have been doing since the 70s, and I'll show you a circuit of a, a hi-fi uh, amplifier that was designed in the 70s that uses a similar design, a lot of them did, is they began putting in these diodes. The purpose of the diode is to provide the voltage drop, that is with this diode being connected as shown, when this point is zero, this point is about seven tenths of a volt positive because of the current through this resistor. That seven tenths of a volt positive puts this transistor right on the verge of conducting. So as soon as the input signal rises slightly above zero, this transistor starts to conduct. Similarly, this transistor does the same, th or this diode does the same thing for this transistor. I'm not going to go into too much of that. Mainly what the purpose of this is, is to look at how we can use the analog discovery, and particularly the analog discovery too, to test these kinds of amplifiers. It uses 5 volts and minus 5 volts as its power supplies, and of course I'm using the same 5 volt, uh, minus 5 volt on this op amp, but that's unimportant for this purpose. So now let's take a look at the actual circuit and what we're doing with the analog discovery. Here is the breadboard with the circuit built up on it. The analog discovery is doing a number of things here. One is it's supplying the input signal. The second is it's providing an oscilloscope, or actually a two-channel oscilloscope, to look at the input and the output. And finally, it's also providing plus and minus 5 volts. So that is the first thing I want to talk about, is the new analog discovery 2 and the fact that it will provide better power supply if you connect it to an external source. The Analog Discovery 1, the original, did not have the capability. You see this cable plugged in here. That goes to a small power supply back there that you can either buy from Digilent or uh, buy yourself. The specs for that are on the Digilent website. But if you plug that in to the analog discovery, then you get a much more capable power supply. That was one of the things that I wanted to test, is whether this would work. Digilent has given you the option of using an external power supply here, and if you use it, they avoid that problem of the low uh, quality power supply that usually uh, you get over a USB cable. Here is the schematic of a Sony HP 178 from 1976 illustrating the complementary symmetry output stages. Now this one is a little different, I point out, because it does use a capacitor in the output. Now the problem with using the capacitor is it limits your frequency response, particularly the low frequencies. However, the advantage of having the capacitor in the output is that it does protect your speakers from DC bias. You see, if this stage is not 
perfectly balanced. There will be a small DC value at this point. That DC value will be flowing through your loudspeakers all the time the unit is turned on. Uh, but for now, let's get on with what we're doing. Here is the power supply window. You'll notice that at the top it says Master Enable is on. I'm going to turn that off. And now the circuit is not receiving power. You'll notice here it says that the positive supply is ready and the negative supply are ready. I have set them to 5 volts. You can set them to lower values. 5 is the maximum. Then when you click on this Enable, the power supplies get turned on. I'm going to zoom in on a little thing a little below that that you'll notice it says auxiliary powered allowing up to 2.1 watts or 700 milliamps output per channel. That is a new feature of the Analog Discovery 2. You couldn't supply anywhere near that current with the Analog Discovery 1. Now what I would like to do is shift over and look at that circuit that we were looking at earlier and see what sort of distortion we might be encountering with that Class AB amplifier. This is the spectrum of the input, that is the output of the waveform generator from the Analog Discovery. It's currently set to 1 kilohertz, and on the far left is the is one the 1 kilohertz fundamental, and then across this is about 1.9 kilohertz, so that's about 2, and this would be 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and so on. Now let's add the channel looking at the output. You may notice that relative to the fundamental, there are a lot more harmonics. Let me turn that off again so you can get another contrast. There is the input alone. There is the output. Input, input plus output. Notice how particularly this third harmonic in the input, the second harmonic is larger than the third harmonic. In fact, the waveform generator it looks like it tends to predominate in terms of its its even harmonics are higher than its odd harmonics, but it has a, an interesting feature. The third harmonic is less than the fifth harmonic. The seventh harmonic is higher still, and then it begins to tail off again later. So. This is the characteristic of the waveform generator itself on the analog discovery. So now let's turn on the output spectrum. And here I'm using the spectrum analyzer of the analog discovery. The second harmonic is about twice as much in the output as it was in the input. The third harmonic looks like to me it's about four times as high as the uh, input. The third harmonic looks like it's a little less than twice as high, and so on as you can see. That's why when I first started this video, you noticed that I was looking at the waveform at the transition point. That is when transistor 1 switched off and transistor 2 switched on to see if I could detect any nonlinearity. Well, as you remember from that waveform, it was hard to see if there was any nonlinearity. I thought I could see a little, but that's very subjective. One of the nice things about a spectrum analyzer is it allows you to actually look at these harmonics. So what we have determined is that that class AB output stage does introduce additional uh, harmonics, or at least it does tend to amplify the harmonics, the harmonic content over the original. One reason we know that it's the output stage is the original second harmonic was at this level and the third harmonic was down here. That's reversed in the output, so clearly that output stage is driving the third harmonic much harder than it is the second harmonic. I've now turned on 
the network analyzer of the Analog Discovery 2. This allows us to look at the gain and phase response of the amplifier. Now the yellow trace is the input, the blue trace is the output. You notice there's a little bit of gain, and of course this is actually intended, and by gain I mean a little bit of voltage gain. There is a lot of power gain in this stage. That's what it's intended for, is to uh, provide output power for a loudspeaker or something of that sort. So this is the input, and you see it's relatively constant. It does fall off a little bit near the end. This is 50 hertz to 5 megahertz on the right. So you see that the input is very flat out to uh, around a, a megahertz or so, and then around 5 megahertz it does dip a little. The output of the amplifier, however, begins to drop off at around... 80 kilohertz or so. This is 100 kilohertz. This is a megahertz. So at around 80 kilohertz the amplifier begins to drop off and at uh, about it looks like 85 kilohertz or so the gain is 1. After that the gain is actually less than 1 and continues to fall off down here and this little hook at the end is actually an anomaly that's actually uh, capacitive coupling from the input to the output of the op amp. So forget all of that. Besides, nobody can hear sounds out in that range anyway. Most audio amplifiers are only spec'd out to uh, around 100 kilohertz or so. Look at the phase also. This is the phase. And zero degrees is where this blue line is. Notice that the, the amplifier has almost no phase shift until it gets out here around 10 or 12 kilohertz. Then it begins to drop off a little bit and then out here about the same place where the gain starts to fall off the phase starts to change fairly rapidly then the rate of decline uh, lessens for a little while and then there's a steep decline as you approach 5 megahertz. In fact there's almost uh, 270 degrees of phase shift at 5 megahertz. Once again, as I say, uh, for an audio amplifier, this would be normally as far as you would be interested in the response. The reason it's good to look out in the, to these regions is to see whether you have potential instability. Because one of the things that audio amplifiers sometimes do, especially solid state amplifiers with hot transistors in them, is they oscillate out in the megahertz range. And so it's good to do at least one scan out as far as you can on the uh, amplifier to see if it is breaking into oscillation. If it is, what you will see is rapid variations in the phase of the signal. The uh, analog discovery appears to do a pretty good job out to its 5 megahertz bandwidth limit. What we have shown here is the use of the analog discovery once again, and in this case the analog discovery too. I wanted to use it for this experiment in part because of the new power supply feature and also for uh, another reason which I'm going to save for part two. So I hope this has been instructive and if not instructive at least uh, you, you were pleased by watching it. I will be doing a part two, but in the meantime, have a nice day.